Shabbat Shalom. Welcome to the Philadelphia Assembly. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Today, according to God's calendar, and as we discern God's calendar, is the 16th day of the ninth month of the year 5778. And because we do new moon as full moon, it's today is on the Gregorian calendar, December the 8th, 2018. So if you hear our dates, they don't line up with what you're keeping. That's because we're discerning the full moon is the new moon, according to Psalms uh, 81.3, I believe. And I might have misquoted, but I don't think so. Okay. Uh, the new moon, full moon. Okay. Uh, we're going to continue our expository teaching on the book of Hebrews. We're going to be on part five. And it's going to consist of chapters 9 and 10 in the book of Hebrews. And as I've been going through here, and I know that I'm pointing out that this power or spirit that existed from the beginning, the Ruach HaKodesh in Hebrew is uh, the Holy Spirit in English, okay, or set apart spirit. We know holy means set apart. And the scriptures, especially in the book of Hebrews, not just, obviously all over the Brit Hadashah, or the New Testament, it talks about the Holy Spirit thus said. We're going to see that again, saying the, uh, the Holy Spirit signifieth. Okay, we're going to talk about that. We're going to look at how our Messiah, again, we've talked about how he's a priest after the order of Melchizedek, or Melchizedek, mm -hmm. Melchizedek. So there's several different ways people pronounce that. But if we look at that, we know he's after the order, just like Aaron's sons were after that order, as I explained last week. Okay, so our Messiah is after that order, and as clearly as I can discern it, and obviously it's not 100%, that that uh, Melchizedek, or uh, priest after the high priest of uh, Melchizedek, or Mel is the Holy Spirit. Okay, and our Messiah inheriting that position just as the sons of Aaron inherited that Levitical priesthood, but Christ, or the anointed one, being forever a priest after the, the high priest after the order of Melchizedek, because he has an eternal life, which he received when he was glorified on the day of first fruits or wave sheath. And we're going to talk about that some in today's message. But all these things connect and agree. And if you're just doing a little bit here and a little bit there, and you're coming up with something different than what's done in context, then you need to be checking your understanding and make sure you're following what the book says and not what thus says your pastor or your teacher. Okay, let's make sure we stay in line with what the book says. You know, I'm not condemning anybody for their hard felt convictions. They believe what they believe. That's the way that it is. But let's look at the book and see what the book says. Before we get started on this teaching, let's turn to the east where the temple was and where it will be again when our Messiah returns and open in prayer. Almighty Father Yahuwah, we just thank you and, and ask your blessing upon us, Father. We ask that your Ruach HaKadosh, your spirit would, that you sent and did everything, created everything that was created and lived in our Messiah as him being our temple, as we're going to see in your word today, uh, where the Holy Spirit was housed. You know, the spirit was coming and going. We saw that in the prophets and and just as your spirit would come down and dwell in that tabernacle and then go back up, we also know it wasn't you because no one's ever heard your voice or seen your form at any time. Okay? So all things have to be uh, discerned spiritually. Father, we ask that your spirit be upon us and you give us that extra unction of that Ruach HaKadosh and help us to better understand the word that was left for us in the book of Hebrews and how it relates to the Tanakh or the Old Testament, the law or the Torah and the prophets. We just ask that you would, again, open hearts and minds and teach us what is you to have you to know through that spirit of promise that was sent to us. And we just ask it all in your precious son, Yahushua's name or Jesus name. Amen. I don't, you know, I know a lot of you out there teach that, you know, people are, only heard by calling a certain name. You know, I really don't agree with that. I think people are heard because of them grabbing hold of this covenant of promise, which is mistranslated here in the book of Hebrews as testament. Okay, but this covenant or agreement 
is what we pick up when we pick up or come under that shed blood of our Messiah. So when that happens, we have to walk as he walked. Now, when we stumble, we have an intercessor that's in heaven with Elohim, okay, which is a plural noun, okay? No matter what you how you discern it, it's that way with everything in Hebrew. When that I am in English is on there, that is showing you plural, okay? That's obviously not the Hebrew characters. But we're talking about in English, Elohim, Yahudim, all these different words are plural words, and they're not going to be plural in one place and something different somewhere else. Again, our uh, our Elohim is not the author of confusion. And the book says what it says. Uh, I'm not a Trinitarianist, okay? I'm going to just put that right out there. I don't believe that there's three gods that agree as one. I don't at all. I think there's one most high God the Tetragrammatron, YHWH, YHVH, YHUH. There's many different opinions on that, but that Tetragrammatron or that name of God, okay, is what it is, you know, and it's important for understanding to know what those are. But we're saved by the grabbing hold of these covenants of promise coming under a shed blood of our Messiah, not on how we pronounce the name, but on how we walk. Okay, we have to walk as he walked. If we don't do that, our prayers aren't going to be heard because the one that the Torah is given to, if you don't adhere to the Torah, then your law, then he can't, he doesn't hear your voice. Now, it's not talking about by what name or how you translate or pronounce that name. That's talking about walking as he walked. So let's get into this teaching. Let's jump right in in chapter nine, because we're doing nine and ten. Verse 1, okay, we've already, and I'm going to reiterate back to what we talked about in 7 and 8, okay, but we know that our Messiah is forever a priest after the order of Melchizedek or Melchizedek, okay? Now, verse 9, then truly or verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. This word covenant, same one they trans in Greek is the same one later they translate as testament. And that's because they made the old and the new testament. In other words, the old's done away with, and most bodies or what would call that would call themselves the church, the different uh, organized uh, denominations out there. Okay, organized religion. That's what they would say. Okay, the old's done away with. Now we're under the new. See, so they did that. But really. This word covenant is not, it shouldn't have never been translated, and this word in Greek should have never been translated to testament, other than it's a testimony. That's true. Okay? So but let's, let's read this with some understanding. Then truly the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. So in other words, back there when Moses set up that tabernacle, as we read in Exodus and all over the place, according to the pattern that was up in heaven where the Father is, okay, that he did that. And, and he told Moses to put one together here on earth exactly as it was showed to him on the mount when he was up on Mount Sinai, okay, and he would make an exact replica of that here on earth. And there was step-by-step -step instructions in the book of Exodus on how to do that, okay? And it was just purely making an earthly sanctuary that reflected the heavenly sanctuary, okay? And divine services and a worldly sanctuary, or one here on earth. For there was a tabernacle made the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, okay? So we know that within that temple or that uh tabernacle uh, that traveled with Moses in the wilderness later on the temple that was built uh, after David by Solomon okay and then another temple after that so we knew that these two these this temple was here on earth and this is what this is talking about here but what we're getting to here is now that our Messiah has came and that Holy Spirit has came down and not just visited him like he did the prophets but remained on him and stayed in him, he was what that was pointing towards, okay, was the t him being the temple, okay, that doesn't mean that there's not going to be another temple, that's a whole entirely different issue, but our Messiah 
is recognized as that temple, and we'll see that as we read along in the book. We too are temples when that Holy Spirit of promise comes and dwells and remains upon us. Okay, We're going to talk about that as we go, but we're going to read the scripture. And after the second veil, okay, so when they went into the tabernacle, the, the priest, after the order of Levi, whoever that was at that time period, would go into the holiest of holies once a year on the Day of Atonement and offer blood sacrifices for the sins of his people, for the people, and also for himself. We're going to see that in the verbiage here, okay? And that was all pointing towards our Messiah re going into the Holy of Holies, on the day of the wave sheaf, or the first fruit, day of first fruits, the day that he ascended to the Father, received glorification, became the first fruits of them that slept. Okay? So that's what all this stuff is mirrors. See, that's what you have to understand about teaching of God's word. He, he uses one example to reveal the next. Okay? So after the second veil, inside the, of the uh, tabernacle or the temple, which is called the holiest of all, identifying it, which the gold with the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant, and again, this was all made as what is really going on up in heaven, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the gold pot, pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tabernacle of the covenant, okay? And this is talking about the Ark of the Covenant, okay? What you have to realize is everything that was built, not just by Moses, but anything that was put into that temple, and he instructed them to build this Ark of the Covenant. Okay, there's already an Ark of the Covenant in heaven, okay, where the Father is, and it's got this same thing that's in here. These are just physical manifestations of what's in the spirit realm, okay? And over it, the cherubims of glory, and in, 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 a, in, a, in a heavenly sanctuary, there's cherubims over the, that shadow the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak in particular, because we don't really have a clear image of all that. All we have is the physical to point what's going on in the spiritual. Verse 6, now when these things were thus ordained, or commanded, or told out, they were told to uh, Moses, by the Ruach that was relaying that message from the Father. Okay. Now when these things were thus ordained, that's when they were ordained, when they were given to Moses, okay, and it was given to the priest. The priest went always into the first tabernacle. That's where they went, and also people would be in this first part of the tab tabernacle, but they didn't go into the Holy of Holies, and nor could they, and the high priest only did that once a year. Now, when these things were thus ordained, we know when it was ordained, when it was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, the priest went always into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God. Of God is added in the King James, but the service is the services of God, so it's not a bad ad. It's a good ad, okay? But the second went the high priest alone once every year, okay, because that tabernacle or Christ had not yet appeared on the scene, okay, so the true tabernacle was not here, so this was representing it, what was, our Messiah was going to be doing one time, every, once and once and all, it was played out every year, teaching us, just like the feast are played out. We play those out every year pointing towards the millennial reign and then the second resurrection and new heaven and new earth. We do that every year learning. And they were doing that same thing on the day of atonement when they offered the blood of the sacrifices of other where the high priest went in one time a year. Okay, let's read that again. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors or the sins of the people. Now, notice they said, he says errors here, because if you commit sin knowingly and willingly, those are not errors. That's rebellion. But he's putting this blood sacrifice out there for the errors of the people, either that through ignorance or through weakness at some point in time. That's what these blood sacrifices were for, not delivered sin of the people. Verse 8, this is very important if you really want to be a servant of the Most High God, through His Messiah, you have to accept the Scripture as it's written. Okay? 
not on what someone explained it to you, but what it says. Okay? And I, I'm going to do that even if everybody walks away from it. I don't want that. I mean, I love all the brethren. I mean, I think that most of you that have any kind of experience with me at all know that I do. And I want that unity. But I'm not going to walk away from the truth to, re, to get that unity. Because, brothers and sisters... The Most High, through our Messiah, is what we're going for. We are not going to be in the first resurrection if we don't accept the Word of God as it's written, the uncut Word of God. And most would agree with me on that. Now, verse 8, let's, let's read it like it says and see if you agree with the Scripture and, or with someone what someone talked to you. Okay? The Holy Ghost, or Spirit, because this Greek word here could... Should have been translated spirit every time. They're trying to show the difference between the power and the actual spirit by doing this in the King James translation. I don't necessarily agree or disagree with that, but I know that there's only one Holy Spirit. There's not the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit. Okay, same entity. Okay, because of the translation. So the Holy Spirit thus signified. What's that mean? That means he disclosed it or he said it or he proclaimed it. Okay, the Holy Spirit. That the way of the holiest of all was not yet made known or manifest in the King James. What is it, what's he talking about? The way. We know that our Messiah is known as the way and the truth and the life. Well, that way had not been made known to get back to the Father for that reconciliation that had to be done because Israel... Both physical seed and those strangers that are joined with them had been cut off as a whole. Okay? So that temple was not, that holiest of all was not yet made known because our Messiah had not walked here on earth. He is that temple, the most holy of all. Now you think about that and see if it agrees with the scripture. While as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Wow, what's that mean? Well, even though our Messiah was walking here on earth in the flesh, when he was offered up for the sins of the world, he offered his body. We're going to see that here. And he did that on the day of wave sheep or the day of first fruits. Okay. That way, as long as they were still offering those physical sacrifices, was not yet made known. Okay. It didn't mean that it didn't exist because he did. Seminity offered himself to the Father and he was accepted for the, not just the sins of us, but the sins of the world for their past sins. If they accept that sacrifice and come under that shed blood, that tabernacle was here. Okay. And it sent it up into heaven. So it's not here with us anymore, except for living in us. Okay. Not only our, not only the Holy Spirits, but also our Messiah, according to John chapter 14. Okay. So let's get that in our understanding. So this thing, this holy of holies that was talking about was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was yet standing or still there was sacrifices being offered in that. Verse 9, here's what it's talking about. Which was a figure, that tabernacle, that first time Moses got it and he traveled in the wilderness, he had a portable sanctuary and a tabernacle. They carried it one face to another. That was pointing towards our Messiah. Every bit of that. Okay, that Holy Spirit was coming down and dwelling in that temple and speaking to man. People saw him in Exodus and talked to him, the, the, the elders and all that. They didn't see the Father. They saw the Holy Spirit. That's who they saw. They didn't see Jesus and say Yahushua. He was not yet made known. Okay, there was a prophecy of him to be that Messiah, but he had not yet been made known. Okay. And I know I'm going to draw a flag, but I'm going to pour it out here as straight as I know how, because I want to make sure that he that has ears, let him hear what the scripture says. Okay. That the way of the holy, holiest of all, which is up through our Messiah, was not yet made known while the first tabernacle was operating. Verse nine, which was a figure or an example or a shadow for the time then present, because there was no Messiah in which were both were offered both gifts and sacrifices. They had to do that because without the shedding of blood, there couldn't be the remission of sin. And so, and even for them to even approach the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, they had to take this blood of these of these animals into that holiest to holy every year so that they could approach God, or they'd all die. Okay, so understand that in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him. 
that did the service, that high priest after the order of Levi or Aaron, as perfect pertaining to his conscience. He knew he sinned. It didn't take that over. He had to go back next year and ask it for the same sin. It never did that. But our Messiah's sacrifice, and he goes up on the day of first fruits or wave sheep, and he offers that body then, and it's accepted. Now we're in a new ballgame. Not that the scriptures change, but now this prophecy has been made filled, and now we have that covenant of promise living with us in our hearts, which is the Messiah, and that Ruach HaKadosh that is teaching us all things. That Holy Spirit, okay? Now verse 10, this old tabernacle, which stood only in foods, because they offered foods, and the, not only the priests ate it, and some of it was burned on the altar, and drinks, and diverse washings, and cardinal ordinances, okay, imposed on them until the time of reformation, reforming, okay? Because they didn't have that tabernacle. We didn't have Jesus Christ or Yahushua, the anointed one, with us. This was our example of that, and that Ruach was coming down in there in that temple and speaking to the people until they got cut off. Then he quit coming in. He quit naming prophets to Israel, okay? But that was all a shadow of our Messiah, okay? Verse 11, but the anointed one, or Christ, being come in and high, or being come or becoming, changing, inheriting a high priest of good things to come. See, he inherited that by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Now, that's not talking about another building they're going to build. It's going to be better than the one that Solomon built, okay, or anyone. It's talking about our Messiah's body, okay, not made with hands, that is to say, of this building. How much clearer does the author of the book of Hebrews got to be with this? And, and, and neither by the blood of goats, you know, or calves, but by his, the Messiah's, own body, own blood, I mean. He entered in once into the holy place. And again, he did that on the day of the wave sheaf or the day of first fruits in Leviticus 23. Okay, starts in verse 10. Read that. That's what it's talking about here. That was all pointing back there towards when our Messiah, when he died, he was in the tomb three days and three nights. He rose towards the end of the Sabbath sometime. We know witness there to see if it was after the sun went down or before it went down. But he towards the end of the Sabbath, three days and three nights, he rose. And then on the day of first fruits, check it out. The one that is mistranslated first day of the week, every time in the Brit Hashish or the New Testament should have been on the one of the Sabbaths or the first of the Sabbaths. That was talking about the day of first fruits. Okay? The day that our Messiah offered up his body in, for our sins, his shed blood, all that. Listen to the text. Don't believe the teacher, believe the text. Okay? He entered into, in once into the holy place. Okay? He did, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And he did that on the day of wave sheaf, not on the day of atonement. So the day of atonement, still the day of atonement. But it was, he fulfilled that offering of those sacrifices on the day of atonement for the sins of the people that happened every year. Okay? Our Messiah did that when he died one time. Verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled the unclean, anything unclean, the temple, you, whatever, sanctifieth or setteth apart to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the body, the blood, I'm sorry, I keep saying the body, but it's going to say the body here in a minute. How much more shall the blood of the anointed one or Christ now listen to the scripture, who through the eternal spirit. Now who is he talking about? Is he talking about itself? Or is he talking about the Ruach HaKadosh that signified that back? What verse was that? Eight? Yeah, I think it was verse eight. I don't want to make sure. This book is hard to turn the pages. Yep, verse eight. That's that Holy Ghost. That's not talking about our Messiah. Listen to what it says. How much more shall the blood of the anointed one, Christ, 
who through the eternal spirit, that's the power that he did it through. You look in, in Romans chapter 8. I don't have to go here. It said, it said that, uh, but if you have the one that raised up Christ Jesus Amen. in you, your mortal body is alive. That's what it's talking about here, people. This is not talking about something else. Let's stay in context. Let's make sure Scripture make, uh, agrees with Scripture, not just to hear a little, a little there a little, but everywhere. How much more shall the blood of the anointed one or Christ, who through the eternal spirit, that's how he did it. He didn't do it through his flesh, but that spirit that was come down and remained on him, he offered himself without spot to Theo, which just means God in Greek, or mighty one, purge your conscience from the death, dead works to serve the living Theo. Again, God, or just like El, is, is kind of equal to El in the Old Testament, and it just means singular talking about God, okay? Not being specific. And it just means mighty one, okay? Verse 15. And for this cause, he, our Messiah, is the mediator of the new covenant. This is a bad translation calling it a testament. Okay? But, you know, you do have a last will and testament, so I'm not saying that their intentions was off. I'm just saying that I don't agree with the translation. Okay? Because a testament, a last will and testament, is also considered a covenant. Okay? It's an agreement. Okay? That by means of death, so, wow, wow, and for this cause, he, our Messiah, is mediator of the new covenant, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions, that's talking about his death, him offering himself for this as a sacrifice, for the redemption, that our redemption, that were under the first covenant, that's talking about Israel, okay, that was who was under the first covenant, whether you were grafted in as a stranger or you were born of that bloodline, you, that was Israel, and that's the ones that were under that first agreement. They which are called, see, notice that? And the only ones that can come into this agreement, this new covenant prior to the new heaven and new earth, people, is those that are called. Say, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And that's talking about this priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. Once we die and we receive that at the first resurrection, we're going to be exactly like Messiah and we are going to be priests forever and we're going to keep, we're going to get that inheritance and it's an it's an eternal inheritance. Okay? So even after the new heaven new earth, we're still going to be one with Christ and we're going to be ruling and reigning with him. Those that are in it. You don't know if you're in it? I don't know if I'm in it. We just pray and hope and go after we run that race. Okay? So Verse 16, I know this is deep, guys, and you might not agree with what I'm saying because of what you've already been told, but the scripture is speaking, not, he, not me. I'm just expounding on it. For where a covenant, okay, or a last will and testament is, I'll, so I can qualify it, is there must also of necessity be the death of the testor. Go check out your law. They still do this this way. A will doesn't have any force. Until the person that gave this testament, testimony or this uh, last will and testament, till that one dies, it has no strength at all as long as that testor, the one that testifying, is still alive. Okay, no different with our Messiah. Okay, verse 18. Whereupon neither the first testament or covenant was dedicated without blood. You go back to 24. Exodus chapter 24, verse 6, you'll see that they killed these uh, heifers and, and, and things, and, and they took that blood of that, and they poured it over the book of the covenant, and they said, these things that you've commanded, we will do. Not just the ten, but everything that Moses brought to them in that first offering, okay? So we know that, and that that's the agreement that we're talking about. Our Messiah is the one that they're talking about with his death, as being the testor, and it had no strength until he died. Okay? Let's be honest with it. Verse 19. For when Moses had spoken every precept, and that's back in Exodus 24, to all the people, according to the Torah, 
or the law here, this or instructions. That's what law and Torah mean. Okay? <clears throat> so don't think I'm saying that the Torah means law because, no, I'm telling you the law means instructions just like the word Torah does. It's equivalent to it. Okay? So that's important to understand. Okay? For when Moses had spoken every precept, so he read this covenant to them, when they got ready to go into the promised land, he did it back there the first time after he came down from Mike Sinai, and they went in and spied out the land. They wouldn't do it, so they didn't go in because of unbelief. So that was the first time. So it says, For when Moses had spoken every precept, I know I'm repeating this, to all the people according to the Torah, he took the blood of calves and of goats and with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book of the covenant says book here in the, King, in, in the New Testament, but it says book of the covenant back in Exodus. Go read it. I'm not going to take time to do that here. Okay. And all the people. So he put the blood on them and all the people because that had to be done to give them another start to take this covenant because they didn't keep it before. They didn't know about it. They'd been in exile or they'd been in slavery or in bondage in Egypt and they'd learned the ways of the Egyptians and they give them that. So they sanctified them or set them apart by the blood of these bulls, which really didn't take away their sin, but just made it possible for them to approach Elohim. Okay. Or actually the Ruach HaKadosh. Okay. So that has to make sense. Verse 20. Saying, this is the blood, that's what they said in, in Exodus 24. This is the blood of the testament or the covenant, which the theos here, or YHWH, YHVH, YHUH, that's the three most common uh, depictions or translation of that tetragrammatron talking about the most high. Okay, so it says, saying this is the blood of the covenant which the Theos, or the Father, hath enjoined unto you. So he gave that through the Ruach HaKadosh that thus signified that. Okay? And now it's sealed with the blood of our Messiah when he offered himself once a year. And all these things we're reading are just a picture of that that was going on, being played over and over and over again so that we could understand the spiritual when it became known. It has now been manifest that our Messiah has offered his life for the sins of the world. He went and received, he gave himself as a sacrifice on the day of first fruits. Why do you think they call it that? He was the example of the first fruits of them that slept. He gave, offered himself up one time for the sins of the world that finished this animal sacrifice as long as he is up in heaven making intercession with us day and night with the Father. Okay? So that finished it. So this is the blood of the covenant which the Theos or the Father hath enjoined unto you. Now, and if you want to follow after Messiah, you've got to follow after this covenant as it was done as he did. Okay, verse 21. Moreover, he sprinkled, he being Moses, sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Okay, because they had to clean them. They had to sanctify them. It was the cleansing of the sanctuary. See, there's a lot of different teachings about the cleansing of the sanctuary. Let me tell you something. The one sanctuary in heaven that's up there, there's no sin in that. But in order for us to walk in the new kingdom with the Father, we got to be able to have a new start somewhere. That ain't going to never happen as it is in Revelation 21 because we wouldn't be able to stand before God. Okay, so we have to be anointed with this blood just as those people were back then so that when we do go into the kingdom, we're going to do that. Plus, we're going to re we're going to meet our Messiah in the air. Okay, and you ain't going to meet him either in the flesh. You're going to meet him in the spirit. Okay, so you have to be sprinkled. You have to get this blood. And this is what this is all pointing towards. Moreover, he, spr he sprinkled, Moses sprinkled with blood, both the tabernacle. That's us now, okay, was our Messiah and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost, and that's what we, we are really, is the vessels of the ministry, okay? Verse 22, and almost all things are by law purged with blood. Takes away those 
sins. That's the only thing that could do it. Doesn't do it literally, it's symbolically, but Messiah's blood does it literally. And without shedding of blood is no remission or forgiveness. And I'm going to say sin, even though they didn't say that here. Okay? There's no forgiveness of sin without coming under that shed blood. Just ain't. Verse 23. It was therefore necessary. Now, this is where you got to do some spiritual discernment of what I'm talking about, that the patterns of the things in heaven should be purified with these. See, the very pattern that's up in heaven that's showing what's happening here on earth in the sanctuary it's got, it is being purified. When was that done? When our Messiah died. When he was accepted on that day of first fruits, that cleansed that sanctuary. That's not going on now. That got prepared the sanctuary for the saints or the believers that are going to come in the first resurrection. Okay? With these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. The better sacrifice is our Messiah. There's nothing else that's a better sacrifice than those things that were done there. Okay? And then it, listen to this. And then it, it identifies it in verse 24 for the anointed one, or Christ, because he's the anointed one here. A lot of people don't understand that in Hebrew, even Moses was called the anointed one. And all the high priests were recognized as the anointed ones. Okay? Important to understand that. Okay? But Christ is the anointed one, just as the Father is the Theos, or YHWH. There's no other one beside him. Okay? For Christ, or the anointed one, is not entered into the holy places made with hands. See, this can't be talking about Moses. This can't be talking about Aaron or any of his descendants. It's talking about the anointed one, our Messiah. Okay? So, for Christ entered not into the holy place, and that holy place is in heaven. Even him on earth is a shadow of what's going on in heaven. Holy places made with hands, which are figures of the true that it's in heaven, but unto, the, but unto heaven itself now to appear in the presence of Elohim or Theoe for us. Who did that? Who arrived up there for us? Our Messiah. That's when this sanctuary was cleansed or made ready for the rest. But there's still a time period that's got to be filled between that time and the first resurrection. Okay? But this all goes hand in hand. You can't understand one without understanding the other. And if you mix them, muddy the water with your feet and, you know, mess up the, 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 the grain that was left for all the saints, you know, by trodding it down under your foot, you, you know, you, you did that. This is the word of God, not something somebody says about it. Verse 25, nor yet that he, our Messiah, should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. See, he's going to do it one time and it's going to be for good. And see, if he would have been, he could have been doing that every year if he was back in the beginning with the Father. He could have been going in for us in the holy place, but he didn't. The high priest was which is the Ruach HaKadosh. He was entering in once a year symbolically for the Messiah. Okay? Verse 26. For then must he often have suffered since the foundations of the world. That'd be like dying every year. But now, once in the end of the age, not the world, but the age. You check that Greek word out, they got underlined or world. It means age or ages. Okay, at the end of the ages. But now, once in the end of the ages, hath he appeared to put away sin by what? The sacrifice of himself. So when he offered himself and he appeared there on the day of first fruits, I'm sure the Ruach HaKadosh, just like in Leviticus 23, verse 10 on, offered him up to the Father. He was received for the sins of the earth. He became the first fruits of them that slept. How much more sense does that? How much does anything else make any more sense than that? Scripture does interpret Scripture, but in context, okay? The context is very important. Verse 27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after the judgment, but after this, the judgment, okay? At all men, 
That's not those that are in the first resurrection. But every man since Adam, they're either going to be in the first or the second resurrection. And God's doing that judgment right now of all that's going on. But it is appointed for every man to die and then the judgment. Okay? Verse 28. So Christ, or the anointed one, was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him, for his return, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And what's he coming back next time for? To gather his elect, his saints, from one end of heaven from the, to the other. And we're going to all raise up in the air together with him and meet through him. We'll meet the Ruach, you know, and, and it's all, we're going to receive our glorified body in the same way. It is so awesome when you can read the truth and not have all kinds of these other precepts in your head of something different. Okay? Because the scripture is not confusing. Okay? But what we've been taught is confusing. Verse 10. For the law or the Torah, okay, or even this, if you want us limited to the Ten Commandments, having a shadow of good things to come, because all they were is the instructions, okay, on how to do it. But when you messed up, there wasn't nothing to reconcile you. Okay? So, the law or the covenant, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices, those blood animals, those animal sacrifices, which they offered year by year continually, they offered them every day, they offered them on the Sabbath day, they offered them on the new moon day, and they offered them on every feast day. So every day they were offering sacrifice. Made the command the comers. Okay, so let me read that again in context. For the law or the Torah or the instructions, whatever you limit that to, have a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices. We know what he's talking about which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect or take away their sins. Couldn't do it. You could only point towards our Messiah that would do that. And all those sins that those animals did, all they did was make it possible. They just covered those sins until the Messiah comes so they could approach God. Okay? But the sins were still there. That's why there's still a judgment. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? If they offered it one time and it took away their sin, would they have not stopped offering that for that same sin? No. They, yeah, they would, but they didn't. Because that, the worshipers, once purged, should have had no more conscience or remembrance of those sins. But you do, don't you? Even the ones sometimes come under Messiah in our earthly physical mind, we think about that sometimes, but we got to realize that once we repented, and turned from sin, because that's what repentance means, then we should have no more conscience of those past sins. Okay? But in those sacrifices, animals, and sac these are this was added sacrifices there, but in those sacrifices there is a reminder or a shadow again made of sins every year. So they reminded themselves every year on that day of atonement, and we still need to remember to change and do better every year. Okay? Wherefore, when he cometh unto the world, hmm, okay, our Messiah, when he cometh into the world, he saith. Now, this is really not talking about our Messiah. This is talking about the Ruach, and he's again speaking for the Father, the Theos, or YHWH, or the Tetragrammatron. Okay? So, he saith, he, okay, wherefore, when he cometh, into the world, and we know that the uh, Ruach's coming in and out, and the Messiah comes too. He saith, sacrifices and offerings. We know who said that. It was the Holy Spirit said it in Psalms 40, the 40th Psalm. He cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifices and offering thou wouldest not. But listen, but a body hast thou prepared me. Okay? So, the Ruach HaKodesh had, is talking about our Messiah being that body that he's going to enter on when he comes in him and remains on him after he's baptized. 
Okay, that's what this is talking about. This is the body that was prepared, prepared for the Ruach. And, it, and then it says in verse 6, In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. That's talking about the Father. Had no pleasure. Okay? Verse 7, Then said I, the Ruach, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O the Theos, or Yahuwah. Okay? This is not the Messiah talking to him. This is the Ruach that is the voice of, the messenger that comes for him all the time. Okay? So it, it, we saw that in verse 7, verse 8. And when he, the, the Ruach, said, Sacrifice and offering, and burn offerings, and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not. In other words, didn't really accept them. Neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the Torah, or the instructions. Okay? So, he never did accept that as pardon for those sins. But the Ruach's the ones talking, and the body that was prepared is our Messiah. Verse 9, Then said he, the Ruach, Lo, I come to do thy will, the Theos, or YHWH. He taketh away the first, okay? He, the Father, taketh away the first covenant that was offered, that he might establish the second, okay? And the second covenant he established was what was prepared in the book of Deuteronomy, and the blood of our Messiah sanctified that, and that made that covenant, that second covenant, okay? Verse 10, by the which we are sanctified. Each one of us is sanctified, okay? Or set apart through the offering. Now notice this. Now if this was the same guy saying that, why would this say this in this factor? This, if this was Jesus that was back there. By the which will we are set apart through the offering of the body of Yahushua, the anointed one, once and for all. Verse 11. And every high and every priest, and this is, could have said high priest there, standeth daily in the second, in the first part, you know, in the second tabernacle ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, those physical high priests after the order of Aaron, which can never take away sins. But this man, now what man are they talking about here? Yahushua, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of Theoe. Elohim in the New Testament, plural. You got a problem if you think it's just the Father and the Son. The words themselves give that away. So when he sat down, he sat down in the, next to the Father and the Ruach HaKadosh, next to Elohim. Okay, verse thirteen. From here, from this time forward, from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Now. The enemies, obviously, that's Messiah's enemy too, but that's talking about the Ruach's enemies. That was who David was talking to when it said, my, the Lord said to my Lord. Okay, wasn't talking to Jesus that was born in Bethlehem that lived in Nazareth. He's talking to the Ruach HaKadosh, that Holy Spirit that signifies or testifies. Okay, that's what this is talking about. And if we twist that, we're denying what? The power thereof. Because the Ruach is the power by which our Messiah was risen from the dead. He laid down his life and the Ruach raised him from the dead. The book says that, not me. Okay? Verse, tw uh, verse 12. Again, this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of Elohim from that time forth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering, our Messiah, he hath perfected forever them that are set apart, are sanctified. Okay? So that Ruach came down on our Messiah, that fulfilled. That was the body that was being prepared for. The Ruach was our Messiah. Okay? Verse 15. Here we go again. 
Therefore, wherefore, the King James in Middle English says, but it means therefore, the Holy Spirit also is a witness to us. Amen. Along with our Messiah. For So in other words, he was the only witness in the Old Testament, or the Tanakh, or you know, the, uh, the Torah and the prophets. Okay, he was a witness to those, but he's also a witness to us. Wherefore, the Holy Spirit also is a witness to us. For after that, he had said before. Now, who said that? The Holy Spirit. That's not Jesus. It's telling you this. Don't argue with the book. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith Yahuwah, Y-H-W-H. I will put my instructions into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and their iniquities or lawlessness will I remember no more. Where's, where, 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 do we get to, where, where are we quoting here? We're quoting Jeremiah 31, verse 33. Okay? That wasn't Jesus back there doing that. If it was, then it says, Why, The Holy Spirit also is a witness to us. For after that, he had said before, he, the Holy Spirit, in context, 16, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. Talking about after our Messiah. Lived, died, received that glorified body, that sacrifice, saith YHWH. Okay? I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, that circumcision of the heart, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Verse 18. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering or sacrifice for those sins. They're done away with. They're as far as the east is from the west. Okay? 19. Having therefore brethren, us, all of us that are under that shed blood are the brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of our Messiah. Yahushua. That's how we enter in. Okay? If, if there was a temple here today, we wouldn't need a high priest to go in if we're under that shed blood because that blood would be covering and actually taking away our sins. Gone. So we would be able to approach the Father. That's why when you pray to the Father, you pray in the Son's name. That's because He is taking away your sins and when He hears us, because He knows we're under that, He hears His Son. That's why we're sin, sons already. Because we're under that blood. Verse 20. Now listen to this. By a new and living way. Now, that doesn't mean that any of the covenants, or uh, the instructions, or the Torah, or the commandments were changed, but by a new living way, by our Messiah, that's set down by the right hand of the Father. That's how we do it. By a new and living way, which He hath consecrated for us mm -hmm. through, through the veil that is to say Messiah's flesh. And having a high priest over the house of Theoe or Elohim. That's the true people of God, people. That's the Israel that's being united or brought together that we're us Gentiles are being grafted into as long as the, as well as the physical seed back into that. That's what it's talking about by his body. That's what all this does. But that doesn't get rid of the uh, the spirit or the uh, Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Then verse 22 says, let us draw near with a true heart. Let's be true with the scripture so we can draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We got to do that. We got to accept that blood of Messiah. And then we got to accept, we got to accept every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And all this is the inspired word of God and good for correction. That's what we're using it for. Okay. 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering to this, what it says in this book. For he is faithful that promised. Who promised? The one that actually promised us, we heard it from the Ruach, but it come from the Father. 
The Father is the one that promised it to us. It was delivered to us by the Ruach, to the children of Israel, by Ruach. And Christ, the anointed, the anointed one, brought it to us by the offering of his body one time. 24. And let us consider one another, let's consider one another to provoke unto love. That's what... And that's not what's happening that I see in the body. We're bickering with each other. Let's not bicker with the Word of God. Let's not bicker with each other about the Word of God. Let us, every man, be fully convinced of his own conscience. Okay? But by the Word of God and by the Holy Spirit that that be done, the Ruach HaKadosh. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. That's what, our, that's what we're supposed to be doing because that is what the whole instructions are all about. Is how to love the Lord thy God and to love our neighbor as ourself. And that's provoking unto love and to good works. See, that's what we're doing. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Now, I think people read right over this and don't understand. Every time we were supposed to assemble is written in the book of Leviticus chapter 23. So not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together on the Sabbath. And all those set apart days in that book, because those are the assembly, the sacred assemblies. So not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is already. They'd already stopped doing this, okay, when this book was written. But exhorting one another, and, and, and that means encouraging one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. What day? The end of this age. That we're, what we're talking about, the day approaching when our Messiah is going to return and collect, collect his elect from one end of the earth to the other. And the final culmination is the great white throne judgment, the new heaven, new earth. Verse 26. See, that's why, you know, not keeping the Sabbath, not keeping the holy days. This right here tells you why it's important to do that. Assembling yourselves together. Not just resting on the Sabbath, as I've heard a lot of people say. Well, I rest on the Sabbath, but I go to church on the first day of the week. No. It says those are sacred or set apart assemblies. Holy convocation. Look it up. That's what it means. That means the day you're supposed to assemble. And not assembling on these days is covered in verse 26. For if we sin willfully... Okay, why it say that right after talking about the assembling of ourselves together? For if we sin willfully after that, we okay, turn two pages have received the knowledge of the truth. We know what the truth is it's the Torah, the instructions. There remaineth no more sacrifice for our sins because our Messiah is the walking, talking Torah. Because our Messiah was the only flesh and blood human being that lived a whole life walking that Torah and not sinning one time. Okay? So once you receive that truth of the Torah, you have to walk as he walked. And that includes all the Sabbath, because every seventh day Sabbath and every high day. Every time that God said to assemble yourself together, you forsake that, that's a sin. But so is not loving your brother as yourself. Okay, verse 27, but a certain fearful looking of judgment, that judgment's coming at the white throne judgment, and fiery indignation, that's what happens after the judgment, the lake of fire, which shall what? Devour the adversaries. Okay, there's a quote in Isaiah 26, 11, talking about this. 28, he that despised Moses' law, or the in Torah, Died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Deuteronomy 17, 6 is where it tells that they died without mercy. Verse 29. How much worse punishment or sorer punishment should suppose you? Shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the son of Elohim or Theoe? Okay. The son of Elohim or Theoe. And hath counted the blood of our Messiah that covers that second covenant or that new covenant of the covenant wherewith he was, that's us, the individual, we're the he there, was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. Spirit of the Holy Spirit is one that's the spirit of grace. 
He acts on commands of the Father, but he's still the Spirit of grace. And our Messiah, by offering himself as that blood, makes that grace possible. Okay, Without that shed blood of this innocent man, we couldn't be in covenant. We'd still be separated from God. We'd still be in our sin. For, verse 30, for we know him, that's the Theos who's talking about here, or the, the Father, that has said, and he said it again through the Ruach, vengeance belongeth unto me, I will repay or recompense, saith YHWH, Yahuwah. That was quote from uh, Psalm 135 and Deuteronomy 32, okay? I will repay, saith YHWH, and again YHWH shall judge his people. And when is that? That's going to be at the great white throne judgment. That's when he comes down and the earth looks for some place to, the earth and the heavens look for some place to go, but there was no place found for them. Revelation 20, okay? And that's what it's talking about. But then again, God, the Theo, shall judge his people. Verse 33, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of, of the living Elohim. Okay. But call to remembrance the former days. Okay. In which after ye were illuminated. When are ye illuminated? When that spirit of light. That was in the beginning. When the father said let there be light. And there was light. And it was good. Okay. The Ruach became that. Go back and look at the text. It tells you that Elo, the spirit of Elohim moved upon the faces of the water. It didn't say Jesus Christ or Yahushua the anointed one moved upon the face of the water. It said the spirit of Elohim moved upon the face of the water. Okay. This is says after in the days after you were illuminated, that light gets in you. It illuminates you. You endureth a great fight of afflictions. No afflictions when there's when you haven't received the instructions. You don't have to feel conflicted when you think you can do anything you want. But the minute you take hold of that covenant, you have a great fight of afflictions come on you. Okay, because you're trying to do what the instruction says, you become a spectacle unto the world. If you don't think so, this time of year, when you tell them you don't keep Christmas and you don't do Easter and all them, don't see if that don't make you a spectacle at work with your friends, with your immediate family. It's going to make you a spectacle. Okay? I know it's made me one for 20 years. Okay? Partly, verse 33, Wallace, you were made a grazing stock. Not grazing, I'm gazing. I'll get that out there right gazing stock hmm. stock just means a herd okay and we're the being the remnant we become a gazing stock what does that mean a public spectacle believe me when you keep the word of god you are a public spectacle nobody keeps these things except for the people of israel whether they be physical or they be grafted in spiritual Israelites. Those are the people that take a hold of this covenant. And those become a gazing stock. Both by reproaches. Now, you have, How does your family receive it the first time you tell them that you're not going to keep Christmas or Easter or these things like that? They don't receive that very well, do they? Okay. So that's how you get afflictions and all those things come upon you. Okay. That's what happens when you become a gazing stock. Everybody knows you do these things. And partly, Wallace, you became companions of them that were so used. Who else was that? Everybody that picked a hold of this covenant, David, every one of them that kept God's commandments was persecuted for doing it. And that's not changed. Okay? So, that, so you... And partly, Wallace, you became companions of them that were so used. The prophets, David, all those that took hold of that covenant. Verse 34. For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, who are the author of this book, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. So this guy was probably a teacher, okay? And he was taking some of their tithes because he was spoiling of their goods. Knowing in yourselves that you have a better, you have a, in heaven... Right now, we have our Messiah, Christ Jesus, the anointed one, Yahushua, is in heaven. And, and 
heaven a better and enduring substance. That's what that is. See, that's our promise. That's our guarantee because our Messiah was born in Bethlehem. He lived a sin-free life and he offered his life for the sins of the world through the Ruach and, he, and the Ruach raised him from the dead. That is what this is all about. People, it's not about something else. Knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven, our Messiah, a better and enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence in your salvation, which hath great reward, promise, recompense, promise of reward. That's eternal life. That's that penny, okay, that was offered to all those guys that worked, some of them, all day, some of them part of a day, and some of them a little bit of a day. They got the same reward, eternal life. That's that great promise, okay, that we're talking about of reward. 36, for ye have need of patience, because he that endures to the end shall be saved. Okay, so we got to have patience, and we got to endure by the instructions under the shed blood of our Messiah, that after you have done the will of Elohim, which is keeping his commandments, Enduring to the end, you might receive the promise. Many are called, but few are chosen. Verse 37. For yet a little while, and that little while is from the time our Messiah ended, ascended the last time, on the tenth day of the, uh, I mean, on the fortieth day of the Feast of Weeks. Just this little while. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Okay, he's not going to delay. He's going to be here right on time. Not a day before, not a day late. 38. Now the just shall live by faith. Now, how do you live by faith? By every word to proceed from the mouth of Yahuwah or Yahweh or Yehovah. That's how you, the just live by faith. They trust him. But if any man draw back, that means once you come to the knowledge of the truth, you say, I'm not going to do this anymore. It's too hard. I don't like being a gazing stock. I don't like to be going through all this stuff. And man, let me tell you something. People rather do what everybody else does. It's easier. Okay. And a lot of things maybe we didn't get to do when we were younger. We still want to try to do them. Let that stuff go, man. Do you want eternal life or do you want life here on earth and heaven on earth? You ain't going to get it, guys. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And only the just, those that live by faith and do not draw back, are going to enter into that kingdom. You can't halfway do this. You can't just once in a while do what it says. And if you're not doing it with your whole heart to be pleasing to the Father, it don't matter anyway. Okay? Done with that. My soul shall have no pleasure in him. Hmm. My son. That's a quote from my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Habakkuk 2, 4. 39. We're going to draw it up here. We're a little over an hour. That's okay. But this is a lot of meat. 39, but we are not of them who draw back into perdition, destruction, guys. That's what the word perdition means. Look it up. Destruction. But of them that believe to the saving of the individual, the soul, you and me. And we got to live by every word that proceed from the mouth of Yahuwah or Yahweh or whichever way you pronounce that. But if you don't do that, you're not going into the kingdom. That doesn't mean that you had to do that in perfection. That means you had to come under that shed blood. You had to repent from all that. And you started walking in newness of life according to the instructions that were given us from the Father through the Ruach in Exodus. Okay? And they, I, I'm sure they were already given to Adam and to Abraham because all those guys kept the law or the instructions or the Torah. It's the same as him. So... It was a re-giving of that law to those people that had been in bondage in Egypt. That's why we understand it. We're going to close right there. We'll be back next week to do 11 and 12. This was part 5. Next week will be part 6. Okay? And hopefully people that are hearing this are being edified. But remember, he that has ears to hear, let him hear what, this mess, what the messenger says.